The New Zealand government allows genetic modification for your trials. It is basically a mainstream pragmatic decision. A major European GM disaster forces reversal of New Zealand pro we'll GM We'll take stance. the loss, the Chinese Premier said today, as China woke up to New Zealand organic produce. Worldwide ban on European beef declared as human death toll rises. Violent tropical storms destroy East Coast Township. Scientists Green Party founding members would have been stunned. The party stormed to power with a 70% landslide The couple have been jailed after violating the country's strict new anti-GE laws. Organic legislation was passed today outlawing the remaining use of pesticides, insecticides and artificial fertilizers. New Zealand is now truly clean and green. Take yourself forward to the year 2050. The now subtropical New Zealand is the clean green paradise it once pretended to be. Our agriculture is totally organic, chemical and GE free. Our lives are governed by a system that bases all its decisions around green and organic principles. We are a rich country, exporting highly sought after organic produce to the rich and polluted first world. But that wealth comes with costs. We've had to forfeit some of the freedoms we take for granted today. Transport, energy, diet, housing have all had to adapt to meet restrictive green standards. Global warming has led to massive climate change and we face increasing tropical storms. The Smiths on Auckland's North Shore are a typical green New Zealand family. Sue Smith is a doctor who has adapted well to the new system, moving into natural medicine. Her husband Joe is a technician in the solar panel industry. Their children were born into this green New Zealand. Sam is a typical Kiwi teenager in his last year of school. And his sister, Rachel, just starting high school, is looking forward to a long, healthy, disease-free life in the organic, GE-free New Zealand. The Smiths are us, a typical Kiwi family predicted for 2050, a family dealing with the future we have left them. Happier, less stressful, healthier, wealthier, You'd have a house with no bills, no running costs. You'd have uh, free transport from your solar-charged electric car. We would be world leaders in um, tourism and food production. And the food you'll be eating is incomparably healthier. And your children will be incomparably healthier. And we'll be massively reducing the incidence of this terrible disease, which is cancer. When you hit Auckland, when you hit Wellington, when you hit the South Island, our programs would match our rhetoric. So the oceans and the marine life would be vibrant. I think anybody that looks for New Zealand in, in, in 2050 as being um, a green society, you know, where, 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 where lentils and mung beans and uh, we all crap on our gardens and watch them grow, you know, it's a fantasy and it is never going to happen. There's no future for mankind if we don't worry about the environment. But if green means specifically not using some technologies, I'm less certain. The 21st century is going to be the century of biological engineering. And if we count ourselves out, we're going to be a backwater, and a backward backwater, a poor country because of it. We've got to allow for the fact that in 2050, um, there's going to be things in the landscape we're just not uh, anticipating. Organic farms will be the catalyst for the regeneration or rejuvenation of rural communities. I've got a horrible feeling it would be boring. We will be told what to eat and how to eat it and when to eat it and when to exercise and what to do and, uh, and, and what we can do. Um, and I suppose in a sense I'm, I, I'm being flippant, but uh, the, there's a kind of a, I don't know, there's an imposition about it that, that irritates me. In this 2050, New Zealand has gone green. Switching to wind and solar power means our once polluted rivers are pristine and abundant with life. And wealthy Japanese now breathe easy with Kiwi export air. You can imagine if New Zealand was extremely green and the rest of the world was going the other way, that you know, even visiting Auckland to breathe the air and, and eat the food you know, might become a major sort of tourist ex experience. I think it's going to take um, a lot more than a clean Waikato River to get me to stay in Hamilton for more than a night. Sam! You kids wouldn't believe what this river used to be like. You wouldn't have got me swimming here when I was a boy. Hey Dad! Unless we can meet the expectations that northern consumers have of us, which is that we are a clean green country, 
then we won't be able to uh, export to them. So that's what we've got to focus on, how we maintain the health of land, water, while we actually develop our productive uses of those lands and waters. No country just wants to be on its best behaviour for the sake of it. There have to be, you know, dollars and cents, money in the pocket kind of reasons. How are we going to encourage the right technologies? If we just leave it simply to big profit-making corporations, they may choose the wrong ones. And I think the answer is to set up a framework of laws which um, makes the polluters really pay. At that point, the old system of paying extra for organic suddenly gets turned on its head and you would pay less for the environmentally friendly products, you'd pay more for the polluting products and you'd gradually push the polluting producers out of business. Rather than taxing people to work um, as we do at the moment, if we, if we actually tax people to, to do things we don't want them to do, uh, then what happens is that behaviours definitely change. I hope you've got your assignment. Yes. Show me. But there, there's an additive sort of cost to all of this. It's one thing to control pollution on cars. It's, it's another thing to control smoking. How about smoking in your own home? Uh, how about smoking out of doors? Okay. It's good. <laughs> hey, you guys, what am I... Oh, damn. Damn. Did you remember the mission cert, Mum? Dad's gonna kill you. <sighs> I know he is. The holier-than-thou attitude does exist, and where it does exist, then there is, you know, the potential to make victims of people who don't play by the rules. Random check, madam. Please stop your engine. Okay, your certificate has expired. I'm just gonna have to do an emission test. However, you're still liable for a spot fine. Please start your engine. In 2050, that may seem like complete, almost sort of psychotic behaviour not to have had your, your vehicle brought up to, to green standards, you know, so that might be sort of seen as incredibly, you know, due for punishment. So yeah, I think it's quite likely. Can you uh, turn your engine off and hop out of the car, please? Oh, no. Greens are fascists. They are authoritarian. They're all about rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations never seem to apply to them. Nandor Tanshots gets pulled up for, for, for riding his bicycle without a helmet. And instead of saying, yeah, I should have worn a helmet, he says, oh, my hair is a natural hair helmet. Hello? Hi, Joe. I've been caught. Yes, I know. Yes, 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 they're clamping it now. Surely by 2050, transport uh, is going to be possible without adding to greenhouse gases. Well, Dad's coming. The fossil fuel is the starter motor to start the main engine of the world's economy. And the main engine of the world's economy has to be solar powered. But we've got stuck on the starter motor. What we have to do is use our energy to develop the next phase. And we need to do it quite quickly. We'd all be rich. We'd all be rich because we'd be the only country in the world truly recognised as the country where if you buy food from New Zealand, it's the best food, it's the tastiest, it's, it's the freshest and um, you're going to live longer. We have to go organic. And if we don't, I think that economically any advantage that we may once have had and now are struggling to keep will be lost forever. Nearly every first class restaurant in Europe and North America demands organic produce and that even if we were to devote our entire agricultural sector to farming organically we couldn't supply those restaurants and that's just restaurants. Um, strike me we might be onto a winner. A green 2050 would be totally organic. That means our food would be chemical and pesticide free. We became organic in 1982 because we saw it as a way of perhaps making more money. We didn't have as many costs in farming organically and we thought that perhaps people in the future would want to eat organic food.
some of our top chefs now in New Zealand are openly saying they want organic food, not only because it tastes better, but it, it stores better and it's far better to work with. And there is obviously a premium that people are prepared to pay for um, organically grown, uh, grown produce, but that's only on the assumption that it's manifestly better than the non-organically grown produce. Well, at the moment I find it hard to get past the fact that a green lifestyle is actually a privileged middle class lifestyle. It's expensive. You know, I mean I might joke about organic food, but the plain fact is it is a lot more expensive. When you do it properly, organics is a cheaper way to produce food. So my ideal is organic food that sells at the same price as conventional food but brings a greater markup to the grower because they don't have to use all the chemicals, the pesticides, the drenches, they don't have the animal health problems that you have with the current conventional farming. It seems to me that there's a lot of wishful thinking in this. We kind of like to imagine that in the future uh, the northern hemisphere and other countries will become so dangerous through, I suppose, the application of agricultural chemicals or diseases or especially genetic engineering that will be a safe haven. You only have to look at what's happening now, particularly in Europe, and the more outbreaks of these 21st century phenomena, I'll call them, a BSE, foot and mouth disease. If you track back to where that comes from, that is from unsustainable agricultural practice. You cannot, you cannot, you should not, you must never feed a vegetarian animal its own kinfolk and expect there to be no changes to its makeup as well as its psyche. So we shouldn't be surprised 30 years down the stream that we're getting these appalling diseases occurring in humans. We're nicely isolated, so we're in an ideal position to prevent a lot of what will be 21st century problems breaking out in various parts of the globe coming in. The problem is that I think organics isn't very focused on the actual environmental problems that we have here in New Zealand. It's pretty much focused on the European consumer and their fear of chemicals in their food. Um, but here in New Zealand, the, the issues, the environmental issues, uh, are things that ought to be more to the fore in organics, I believe. People thinking about the future often think, uh, wow, you know, how is this going to look really different and so on. And uh, I think what people often forget is that the environmental damage isn't anything to do with what they look like, it's how they work. What you could say about the house of 2050 is that you'll walk in winter or summer, wet or dry, and it'll be comfortable. And it won't be using any energy to do that. It'll just be comfortable through its design and a cheaper place to run. It'll, it'll certainly be a house with no bills. So why should we go with Rand Earth? Well, it's, it must be the most efficient building material and it's certainly one of the healthiest things that you can build your home with. See these 35 mil thick walls? Um, in 2050, green housing is about more than just paint colour. Sue and Joe are house hunting and have a whole range of environmentally friendly home options to explore, like the Earthsong Eco Neighbourhood, which updates the ancient construction of rammed earth with 21st century technology. A resident could paint it with eco paints if they wanted, but made with vegetable materials. So how does co-housing work? I'll show you on the site plan here the the main feature is the pedestrian friendly design, all the cars... I wouldn't envisage the green future to be a sort of romantic future where we're all having a very similar lifestyle in, in sort of physical terms, but a future where we become much more individuals. And it would certainly be green to live in a high-tech house, if you like, as long as the technology you have in your house is sustainable. With all these windows, how does this affect heating? Well, there's double glazing to the eastern side and the southern side of the house to take care of that problem. Plus, the roof and the walls are both very well insulated and that should help to get a healthy, warm, dry indoor climate. Is the wooden floor going to go right through the house? No. We uh, deliberately didn't put wooden floor down. The New Zealand suburban house is open to a whole 
raft of possibilities, along with other traditional materials, we can create houses that are quite different. The biggest difference you would notice would be the use of solar panels on roofs or solar, solar generating roofs to the point where every house will do that because it's cheaper than the power company. In the sunshines the solar panels make electricity which is fed into the mains and it's metered as the mains is when it comes into your house. But for your standard meter if you put power the other way through it it'll just run backwards uh, and so at the end of, end of the day or the end of the year you might supply as much electricity to the national grid as you would take out of it in cloudy periods. You put in power when you're not using it and you take out power when you want it and the sun isn't shining. And the aim is that over the year you uh, end up in balance, sort of like having a bank account. It's quite an elegant system really. Because we can control the houses with electronics and that control can be very broad. We can control the uh, humidity, we can control the wind, we can control the inside the house I'm talking about, we can control the heat, the temperature, the coolness, we can open it up in the day and close it up down at night. This kind of thing will, will, will creep more and more into the normal range of housing materials. Yeah, yeah I can see it. That's cool. Great views. We straight out New Zealand's a very wasteful country. Uh, a lot of the energy that we use now could be saved for very little cost. So that's a huge resource just waiting to be tapped. New Zealand's well positioned for wind energy and simply that the wind is always moving. We've got hot hills, we've got areas that's ideal to put wind generators. In this 2050, it's not just what goes into the house that has to be rethought, but what comes out as well. In the future, unless we design buildings this way, we're not going to be sustainable. And a building doesn't need to be hooked up to a sewerage system or that it, maybe it has its own. Some of the family waste back into the system. Feed Joe some of his own shit for a change. We don't have to drink it straight yet. The best way to handle your sewage is to handle it yourself. The last thing you want to do is to concentrate all your excrement in one place, have huge mountains of human excrement. The last thing you want to do with it is like putting all your... The last thing you want to do with, with criminals, put them all together. They'll infect each other. The organics movement has been given a huge boost because of concern about genetic modification. And I think that we're going to look back on this period of time as being an aberration, as being a failed experiment. In 2050, we may have had the wisdom to know where GE is applicable. We may have the wisdom, or we may also have the wisdom to know it's inappropriate and, and would actually damage our whole, whole economic base. In this 2050, we're not just organic, we are GE free. But making something illegal doesn't guarantee it'll disappear. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that by 2050 we will be eating gen genetically modified foods of sorts. And you'll have GE parties. That's what you'll have. <laughs> in a GE-free world there will always be a black market. You sure, sure you don't want any more? No, oh. oh, no, Joe, really. Sue, <laughs> so that was lovely. Once you so impose lovely. a regulation there is always somebody who wants to get round it. Thanks to the old man, he grew the beans. Ooh. The capsicum, the silver beet, and the beetroot. Huh? Well, your list goes out and people will come along and the idea is you don't come fancy dressed, you come with a GE piece of fruit. And he's such a genius, aren't you? Well, it was a nice way to fill in the time until we got to the good stuff. And the fun of it won't just be in tasting the fruit, you know, it will be that you're breaking the law, that you're challenging society. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> if we imagine that GE goods wouldn't just be, you know, fortified milk, that they might be the most amazing, totally sensation-driven, taste-driven, almost drug-like foods imaginable, then yes, I can totally see that happening. Hey.
Three, oh, they oh, wow. are great. Don't ask me what they are either. Mm. Usually you can get, only get them one at a time. But It'd be pretty dangerous. You know, they're saying now that we've only got a certain amount of period of time before if you brought in GE crops, you know, and that they would spread. It'd be as bad as bringing in foot and mouth. You know I mean? Like, you'd be shot. Oh, they're soft. Can I go next? Yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. Oh, nice bag. I know. It's special. <laughs> oh. Isn't it beautiful? You can't ban genetically engineered products. As long as people have the rational choice whether to buy or not to buy, that should be sufficient. <gasps> That's it. Oh it's from China. <laughs> well, there isn't any demand for GE produce, and you can't have a black market unless there's a demand. Nobody ever went into a shop that I know of and said, hmm, yes, I see you've got carrots, but have you actually got GE carrots? That's what I really want. I mean, it doesn't happen. People go into shops and say, hmm, I see you've got carrots, but have you got any organic carrots? I had a variety of plum that I've never had before. These plums were enormous and extremely sweet. They were, in some respects, the most delicious plums I've ever eaten. I mean, if genetic modification produces fruit like that, and if it's banned in New Zealand, I can assure you there'll be a black market in those plums. Okay. That's wild. <laughs> Clearly, the discovery of the genetic basis of life has been the most important discovery that mankind has made, uh, probably in its evolution. Uh, we will use that information in many ways to make better drugs, to make people healthier, to improve the environment. We lose so much of our native forest and our wildlife to um, possums and stoats and other introduced animals. Um, the technologies of uh, genetic engineering actually hold out the promise that within a relatively few years we could develop a really effective way of controlling those pests. The whole GE industry depends on what ifs. What if we were able to feed the world? What if we were able to cure cancer? Um, nobody's done it yet. Nobody's even close to doing it. The things they've actually done are actually pretty trivial and not all that successful. They've made a whole range of crops tolerant of Roundup. Well, big deal, so we get to use a whole lot more Roundup on the crop. In 50 years time it will be a much more mature science. We'll have had some horrific surprises. Some things will have gone dramatically wrong and why do I say that with a fair degree of confidence? Because every other major science and technology or many others over the last 200 years have gone through a phase of, of early enthusiasm, rapid adoption, then a few pretty dramatic surprises and then a period of reflection and working out what is safe and sound. The key thing that drives attitudes to genetic modification at this point and what's kind of like a not very sophisticated debate is what you might call a yuck factor. If you're doing weird things to fish, that's kind of not a good thing. If you're doing weird things to trees, that's not so much of a problem. If you're doing stuff to food, that's bad. If you're doing stuff for medicine, that's not so bad. If we don't accept selectively um, the, the science that's advancing GE, we will become a little native backwater because some of the great prospects for health in the future will come out of GE. We'll call you when we get there, okay? In a green 2050, New Zealanders like Sue's brother-in-law may find they need to travel overseas for GE-related medical treatment. Bye, sis. Love you. Love you, you too. We will. Miss you. Say hello, Mum and Dad. Most medications in the future will have a genetic base to them, either in, and certainly all of them do in terms of the science leading to their development, and many of them, in fact, come from genetic uh, bioengineering. So we wouldn't want to leave the first world in terms of access to medications. Gene therapy has failed dismally. There's no example of gene therapy working to cure any disease. Could you imagine anyone declaring Starship Children's Hospital nuclear engineering free? I mean, it would be ridiculous. Of course we want genetic treatments for diseases where that's possible. In order to do this, we need to keep a critical mass of scientific knowledge. 
And if we have a kind of a move toward this anti-science Ludditism, we'll lose those people. We long ago lost all the New Zealand scientists who were interested in creating nuclear bombs. That doesn't bother me. The green future requires really good science and research. New Zealand could be a world leader. And we'll need this new science as we're forced to adapt to the problems of the future. We're faced with the biggest problem humanity's ever faced before, which is global climatic destabilization, because that's what it's really about. If we do nothing about that, well, the planet will become uninhabitable very quickly. You know, we are the first generation to look at extinction in the face. Probable extinction. If we do nothing about it, we are extinct. At the beginning of the 21st century, a community group in Christchurch established a series of small community gardens, using neighbouring backyards and volunteer labour to grow vegetables. These urban gardens caught on, and now, in 2050, every school student must put in several hours a week labour in their local patch. It's just a fly, like last time. No, it's different. Look. No, you look. No, I think it's just a fly. If in 2050 we followed a green path, all available land could be easily used for growing a huge amount of food. You, you can produce uh, enough food for a family on a very, very small Bye. amount of land. I've got to get to the 515. Come on. Sam! If you don't hurry up, you'll have to do the weeding on your own. There might be community gardens, there might be locally based uh, food producers, there might be home gardens, uh, a whole range of options. But, but certainly a bigger emphasis on small-scale local production of food. You're a dick. You're a dick. You made me do the weeding last week. Good for you. I don't know how you force New Zealanders back into being gardeners, into be growing their own food. I can see people who are, you know, the 2050 equivalent of retired or between jobs, maybe, you know, choosing it as a recreation. Point seven. Ah. Oh. Three hours already this week. I should be paid for this. But I can't see people kind of all behaving, you know, like little driven entities round the clock doing their rotor of work. I just don't see it as being part of the emerging society. This is the plant here. You've got to go under it. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting idea. I, I'd like to see in those small gardens where we're all supposed to spend a few hours great masts with loudspeakers that would actually broadcast patriotic messages in favor of the government of the day. And since uh, the internal combustion engine would be outlawed on these farms, we'd all be behind oxen slogging through the mud. I don't see it as any kind of compulsory thing. I just see there being more support for it and more opportunity for it. And I see that as one way of actually getting those community gardens together, showing our children how to grow things, how to nurture the earth and bring it back into its natural state. To feed a whole city, you need to move beyond the backyard. In this 2050, productive inner city farms have forced us to rethink the division between town and country. Farms surrounding a city will provide food for that urban area and there will be some relationship formed between the consumers and the people producing the food. The reason people go out and buy you know, kind of 10 acre blocks is, is this delight with the, with the countryside. What I'm saying is bring the countryside into the city, allow it to, to move up the waterways and, and turn it into a profit making concern. While these gardens may help feed local communities, in a green 2050, New Zealand will still rely on agriculture as a major source of trade and export income. This is a huge industry, you know what I mean? And everyone's just got to drop the idea that this is a hippie orientated, woofer orientated society. This is an absolute diamond of resource of knowledge and it should be taught to people, it should be sold to people. It's not a hippiedom, it's a big, big professional industry with lots of money involved. You've got to produce organic food because everything we're told about agriculture is the opposite to the truth. If you want to maximize yields, if you want to maximize production, it's on small farms, not on big ones. And the difference is massive. 
You're not producing three or four times more, you're producing seven or eight times more on small farms. If you have monocultures, we know that you can get a lot of productivity of that one crop off a certain piece of land. With polycultural, very diverse land uses, you get less off the one crop, but you get a far greater diverse um, economy emerging and a lot more stability economically if something doesn't do so well other things can hold that base. And I certainly think organic gardening is fine and has a place. I'm all in favor of it. But to imagine that it actually could feed the whole of the human population or even the whole of New Zealand, well that really is beyond the pale. Oh, I'd love to someone to tell me that there isn't enough resource within the country to, to feed the country. Otherwise I'm, we're all barking up the wrong tree. So you need a diversity. You don't know which ones are going to be affected by droughts or by floods or by heat waves, which we're going to get with global warming. The current indications are that western areas of New Zealand from New Plymouth southwards will get wetter and the eastern areas will get drier. In the drier areas, of course, they'll be more drought prone and that brings up issues in regard to water supply, for town water and also irrigation in the provinces like Hawke's Bay for the agricultural activities. You've got to produce your own water. You can't count on getting water from the Waikato indefinitely. How do you know there's going to be any water in the Waikato? While the level of the Waikato River may drop, global warming may have a very different effect for those of us who live on the coast. Sea levels will rise. That means something like um, 25 centimetres or one foot by 2050. Uh, much of the Hauraki Plains will be underwater. Many of the areas where we have put our cities, reclaimed land like Wellington, Auckland, Dunedin, Littleton, all of our ports have got reclaimed land. All of them are right near, near the water. All of them, the main population centres, are low down close to the water. So that aspect of global warming, that will bring with it sea level rise because of the melting of the ice caps. A warmer climate means more active insects and more active life cycles, so it means more of them. Without pesticides, Sue has to use alternatives to fly spray. Most households have a good selection of insect-eating plants. If you've got a lot of mosquitoes that are potentially a disease-carrying mosquito, you certainly have to adapt your lifestyle. As one who's lived in the tropics and worked in, in countries where dengue was endemic and where malaria was endemic, you adapt your lifestyle very rapidly to, to cope with that. And it's not something that uh, I think is remotely beneficial to New Zealand. All Aucklanders having to sleep under mosquito nets or mosquito screen all their houses uh, is, is an enormous change in lifestyle. Well, you could imagine some um, disease sweeping through the country and wiping out all the apple trees or all uh, the wheat or something and, and then petitioning Parliament to use um, pesticides or herbicides to stop it because it's a national emergency. The invaders of New Zealand are not going to arrive in the 21st century equivalent of a Spitfire or a Waka. They're going to be six-legged green and well below the radar screen. That's where the focus has got to be. Think of New Zealand's security as its biosecurity. Do you think that people would come here and try and undermine our green status? Chances are they, they would. You know, that's a bit of a, an outlandish thing to say, but it would put us at risk of all different types of things, particularly biosecurity risks. Climate change will bring much more news of new insects that um, suddenly arrive, make the news, either get dealt with by um, biosecurity officers or get away on us and, and become rampant in the landscape. The Green Society in 2050 uh, is going to be, at least at our borders, um, a siege society. It's going to be a very difficult country uh, to move in and out of. Where we should have draconian measures are on the ships that visit our ports because when they discharge their bilge water, that's what brings those sorts of life in from around the globe.
If New Zealand was totally green in 2050, I would assume that public policy measures, biosecurity might be a super ministry. We might have a whole different approach to border control than we do now. I mean, you cannot overrate it. It's going to dominate society. It's inevitable. It's frankly inevitable whether we go green or not. Ladies and gentlemen, for your own protection, please keep your glasses on while the bell is ringing. Kia ora. We need to put the responsibility, the financial responsibility, back on the people who cause biosecurity incursions. If a greebly can be traced to your particular shipment, then the cost of dealing with it should be put back on you, and if you can send it back further upstream to the person you imported from, then good on you. But I actually think we've got to stop thinking that it has just got to be a public cost all the time when private interests are making the profit and creating the risk. If you don't go organic, you're going to have a, 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 a continued increase in the cancer rate. The amount of uh, synthetic organic chemicals that we use in the world today has increased by 500 times in the last 50 years. It's not colossal. We poison our ground. Where do you think all this poisons go? They go into the groundwater slowly, so you get poison groundwater. Not much is said about it, but we have a lot of contaminated sites around New Zealand, and all of those are contaminated from agricultural chemicals. I remember seeing packets of um, sprays for fruit trees with that, that horrible smell those things have, and the big poison uh, written across the packet. And it just seemed to me completely wrong and completely illogical that you would spray poisons onto food. And this cocktail of all these pesticides, many of which are classified as carcinogens, and a lot of them are classified as probable carcinogens, and we still go on using them. No one can work out what the additive, antagonistic, and synergic effects of 70,000 different chemicals, of which a large number of them are pesticides, can have on the human organism. It's impossible to do it. And if they say they can do it, they're liars. And I think of all the Greens who for 20 years bashed on the doors of power and said, if we don't stop using these ozone-depleting chemicals, we are going to have a problem. And we've got a problem. And it's going to be with us for at least another two generations. And we're going to have more skin cancers. And we're going to have more blindness and more cataracts. We're going to have more damage to our immune system. And we're going to have more effects on crops. But there's nothing inherently safe about organic food either. It can be contaminated in, other, in, in ways too. So what we have to do is be sure that the public is given foods that are safe. I think we'll have uh, all sorts of things that look a bit like warrant of fitnesses on the farm, you know. Is your farm fit to drive? Uh, it might sound radical, but we do it with cars today. So I think we're going to do it with land uses tomorrow. See ya. Toodaloo. There would need to be tangible benefits of greenness and improving health statistics would need to be there just as proof to citizens that this was the right way to go. As soon as people get it into their heads at a health food store, the health food store is the green grocers. All right? That is the health food store. And once you get your head wrapped around that, you'll be taking care of your own health. And you might, hopefully, you won't need the medical research to lift your organs out and go and play some other plastic gizmo in there because you never took care of it in the first place. I think New Zealanders might exercise more in addition to just eating organic food. It's not just organic food that makes you healthy. We might be riding more bicycles, I would hope we were. We'd get the exercise and the transport and we would lose the pollution and the congestions. Healthier workers would be an economic benefit to employers, who in turn would provide the incentive with reward schemes. Congratulations, you have had zero sick days this year. Today is a bonus mental health day. Please report the reception. I believe I've struck the jackpot. You have indeed. Congratulations, Joe. Enjoy your day off. Have a nice day. Cheers. See you tomorrow. Bye -bye. Okay. I can totally see that scenario where people would be rewarded for not having days off.
There is also the question of whether technology will make some workplaces unnecessary. It may well be that people are not having this kind of desire to move around all the place, for example, from home to work. Much of the work can be done from home, and the kind of travel time that we use up today will probably use in a different way, either for work direct, uh, directly or recreation. As far as working from home goes, you don't get the creative input that you get in a group environment if you're working by yourself at home. You don't get the new ideas. We are a little herd-like creature. Hello? Hello? Up here. There is loneliness attached to working from home, but you would also imagine that by that stage that, you know, we're not talking about tapping away on a little computer, are we? We're sort of talking about interacting in a holistic three-dimensional space. So, um, you know, talking to people as if they were there. Computer interactions are not going to replace normal, traditional, face-to-face -face human interactions. I think we're hardwired actually to want to have the close proximity of people. How are you going today? Tired. Have you had the cleaner in this week? Yeah. Did you do my exercises? I, um, no. You have to do those exercises. Maybe we can discuss a change in your program. Maybe a change in your medication might help. I'll take your blood pressure. Just as those who maintain their health are rewarded, those who don't take care of their health, who choose to smoke or are overweight, will be forced to bear the cost and pay for their own treatment. There are other problems we will have to solve, but we need to reach consensus as a country to make sure we arrive at the New Zealand we want to live in, in 2050. I think with the huge increase in world population, uh, people are talking about 10 billion, uh, that this planet can't sustain that, and so we have to look at more sustainable ways of living. Somebody has to lead that, and I think New Zealand has the opportunity of doing it. It's by no means certain that genetic modification means more or less pesticides, it means a different style of farming, and, pr uh, and my guess is that over time it will lead to a massive reduction in the use of chemicals, and most people would want to have a, a less chemically toxic environment. You might as well try to outlaw telephones and, and, you know, and enforce laws in favor of carrier pigeons, as do away with genetic engineering in the 21st century. But I mean, that's an extreme version of it. There's no need, there's no need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. All we're saying is that we're an island and we can afford to maintain a certain amount of biosecurity. We set out in 1982 to prove to ourselves that it could be done organically. We have proved that to be correct. I don't know how Japan or China or Europe are going to face these problems. They are complex and an incredible task. If we can't do it, who the hell can? The arguments in favour are enormous. The self-sufficiency argument is enormous. The very fact that you're, con you're contributing to all the battle against climate change, the most important battle that exists. New Zealand needs to get off its dependence on overseas oil energy imports. And the only way we're going to do it is with solar power and wind and hydro backup. Well, I suppose it's a bit like having your own oil well, really, isn't it? In your own backyard, it's on your roof, solar panels. Yeah, it's like having your own energy source. Brilliant. Look, we are so inefficient, um, the way in which we use the products of the earth. It's absolutely a false economy for all these food producers that are not organic uh, to claim that they're producing a cheaper product. They're just paying, they're just transferring part of the cost of the product onto the environment and claiming that it's cheaper. But if you live downstream, uh, you're bearing the cost and, and that's something that people are not going to tolerate in 2050. I don't think there's any need for New Zealand to rush down what I call uh, generation one applications of GE science to agriculture. It doesn't help us at all in our place in the world, pampering the palates of the prosperous. There's a lot of hope placed in organics, but I think sometimes that organics is held up as the ultimate saviour, as sort of the third coming of Christ, and I think that we really have to examine that, whether it's real, whether it's achievable. 
the Green Revolution won't take place. It will be a slowly merging of green ideas into the world that we already have. A green society only happens when people start to realise for themselves that there are better ways of living, there are more human ways of living, there are more satisfying ways of living than just the um, getting and spending that defines our lives at the moment. This program was made with funding